in light of this big overdue conversation people in North America are now having about racism and its effects, we need to talk about the war on drugs. The war on drugs is an excellent example of all kinds of things the state does and how it operates, from using violence against innocent people to concentrating wealth to maintaining white supremacy. This topic has always been important to me as it's maybe the most obvious examples of why the state and the capitalist system are wrong. But it wasn't until I started looking at those issues, the state, capitalism, and racism, systemically, that I came to understand why drugs were still illegal. It's nothing to do with how dangerous they are. It's about power. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. For some of you, this will be a history lesson. For others, a lesson in how politics and the law work how capitalism works, where poverty comes from, or why racism is a system embedded into the culture and the state, not just an individual problem. My goal in this video is to explain how all those forces come together and affect us and why they destroy so many people's lives. I always use the official term, the war on drugs, because of how obviously and clearly it perverts language. You can't make war on drugs. You can only make war on people. But the war on people didn't actually test as well with focus groups. If it was really about getting rid of dangerous drugs, surely pharmaceutical drugs, which kill far more people than all illegal drugs put together, would be illegal too as would alcohol and cigarettes. But because of the rhetoric of criminalization, we say drugs to mean illegal drugs, and the amount of stigma the public attaches to a drug reflects the amount of effort propagandists have put into stigmatizing it. It's related to this stigma on crime and criminals. Crime is just anything that's against the law. We all break the law. We're all criminals. Breaking the law doesn't mean being wrong. It means the law has nothing to do with freedom or justice. We're told the law is unbreakable and everyone gets punished for violating it. But that is obviously not true. For example, federal police have raided legal cannabis dispensaries, stealing not only products but files and databases on customers. These businesses were legal under state laws, and under the Tenth Amendment, the federal government is not supposed to intervene. But it does. In fact, the drug war has trampled on the Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, Eighth, Ninth, and Tenth Amendments. You see, laws aren't for everyone. They are selectively enforced. Drug laws are just a typical example. Rich people take drugs too, but they don't get their doors kicked in. They don't get thrown on the ground. They don't get shot or beaten. They don't even get arrested. This is a perfect illustration of the words of Proudhon, who talked about laws as spider webs for the rich and mighty, steel chains for the poor and weak, and fishing nets in the hands of government. The war on drugs is what you might call a priority policy, as opposed to the Bill of Rights. And that doesn't depend on which of the two political parties occupies the White House, by the way, as both of them are complicit. Getting so many people to care about crime was quite, quite the propaganda victory. It made them think anyone convicted of a crime must be a bad person that we have to lock away, regardless of the nature of the crime or how they were living or what motivated them. In this way, the so-called rule of law individualizes a systemic, system-wide problem. 
It ignores all the conditions of the crime and places all blame on the choice of the individual. It's the same when a cop is charged with murder or something, and no one suggests looking at how the system of policing itself empowered this guy to kill. No, you fire or suspend one person or a couple of people, and then you can pretend the problem has been solved. They do the same in the military. I guess you could call it the isolated individual hypothesis, the belief that people and their actions can somehow be understood in isolation and not in relation to culture, economic conditions, legal limits, and so on. You see the isolated individual hypothesis when police kill a black guy and conservatives rush to point out the guy's faults, as if a rap sheet could justify murdering him in the street. They never do the same with cops, never bring up uh, how many complaints there were against them and, and for what. In fact, they humanize them. He's such a nice guy. And think of his family. They don't even notice the double standard, most people, um, how the victim has to justify their own life unsuccessfully, but the perpetrator doesn't even have to justify their murder. Double standards are actually another great example of how propaganda works. Everything we know about the state or about the capitalist system is considered justifiable. War kills millions of people. Well, it was a tough decision to make, but ultimately I think it was the right one. We hear that on the news, we hear that in their memoirs, etc., etc. What if I killed one person? What if I just killed a cat? I wouldn't be able to walk down the street anymore without getting pelted by something. But these mass murderers got rich, creating all kinds of suffering for other people, and they're not in jail. They still get paid to talk. Or what if, what if I walked around town in groups with handcuffs, pepper spray, and guns, demanding to look inside people's bags and pockets and the trunk of their cars, and taking things from them if I say it's not allowed? The police do that. Is it suddenly okay to do those things if I put on a uniform? What if you were trying to sell the thing that I say isn't allowed? Can I kidnap you and sell you into slavery? No. But then why do the police do that to thousands of people every day? It's pretty much the purpose of the war on drugs. You know propaganda has been effective when double standards are this blatant and we don't even notice. But again, all this is normal. The ruling class in any society indoctrinate people into accepting their rule, however little freedom or justice they experience as a result. Poverty is explained away as an individual failing too. And yet just just the war on drugs as one example can illustrate to us how poverty is systemic. Criminalizing drugs raises the price of drugs, making it more lucrative than anything else, so you start selling. You get caught and thrown in jail, even though you weren't necessarily hurting anybody else. Then when you get out, you carry the stigma of jail and crime and drugs. So no one will hire you, or let you live in their building, or let you have welfare, or let you have a loan. They won't even let you vote in a lot of places. So one person does something the state forbids and has to pay for it for the rest of their lives. And when we, we just look at the individual and we say, oh, they should have worked harder or some other bullshit. The system has to teach us to think this way, to stop us from sympathizing with its victims, and close off our critical faculties so we don't start asking why. Or maybe, you know, these, these poor people, maybe they have jobs. A lot of them have several jobs. 
and they pay poverty wages, so they need another job. So they're too busy and they're too distracted trying to survive to understand the root of their problems, so they end up fighting with other poor people instead of the real enemy. One feature of all states is a monopoly on the creation of laws, which it's always used and selectively enforced to enrich and empower its owners, like corporations and interest groups. The war on drugs has been a veritable cash cow for so many of these people. Criminalizing drugs wasn't something the public had been clamoring for, just a few people. But then, that's how policy works. First, one or a few people decide they'll benefit from some policy, then they tell politicians to pass it. Sometime before the law itself passes, there's a propaganda campaign to lay the intellectual foundation, the justification for the policy with the public. If you said you were criminalizing cannabis because a few people had a major financial interest in it, you wouldn't get reelected. If you mounted a campaign to demonize the Mexican drug marijuana, you could then pass these laws and raise the budgets of the anti-drug departments and look like a hero. What might such a campaign look like? Well, you would for sure want to associate the drug with some scary words. <laughs> like this. Now, these are some scary words. Shame, horror, despair. Weed with roots in hell. Weird orgies, wild parties, unleashed passions. And apparently they also think that you inject marijuana? That's new to me. <laughs> but a poster like that will easily scare churchgoers, old people, and parents at the very least. You might put out a video disguised as vital information, like Reefer Madness. Or maybe you would associate the drug in the eyes of white people with those other two things that they're afraid of. Black people... and Mexicans. It was Harry J. Anslinger, Commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, who crusaded to regulate the dangerous intoxicant responsible for delirious rage and violent crime during the 1937 Congressional hearings on the Marijuana Tax Act. He was aided by sensationalist media reports on the devil weed, including the infamous propaganda film Reefer Madness. In his testimony to Congress, Anslinger stated, there are 100,000 total marijuana smokers in the U.S., and most are Negroes, Hispanics, Filipinos, and entertainers. Their satanic music, jazz, and swing result from marijuana usage. This marijuana causes white women to seek sexual relations with Negroes, entertainers, and others. Somebody think of the white women! <laughs> We listen to that kind of nonsense today and think, well, those people were pretty naive. But the people spreading these lies weren't naive. Let's keep that in mind. Hmm? Anslinger himself had already gone on the record as saying weed was harmless. <laughs> they knew what they were doing. They were using the state as it is used every day, using violence to line their pockets. The descendants of these early prohibitionists are still around today, lying to parents and kids. Now we call them Partnership for Drug-Free Kids or uh, 
narcotic educational foundation of America. They're still sponsored by rich people, which have included the biggest cigarette and alcohol makers, though now they seem to be mostly pharmaceutical firms. In other words, corporate lobbyists are in charge of policy and the propaganda behind it. Again, that's normal. And of course, kids, you know, they find out eventually they've been lied to. And some of them then go on to try things like heroin and meth. Because, hey, if every adult has lied to us about weed, maybe they were lying about everything else. Harry Anslinger got his wish. His department got a bigger budget and workforce. Today, his department is called the Drug Enforcement Administration, or DEA. Its 2020 budget is for nearly $3 billion, including more than $400 million for what it calls international enforcement. There's a lesson here about how government departments work. They always lobby to be treated as more important, regardless of how useful, useless, I should say, they are so they can increase their budgets and their influence. New departments, new laws, bigger budgets, all give the impression that something is being done about a given problem. When in reality, problems are never, yes, I said never, and I'll say it again, never solved by a government department, or else all the people who solved it would be out of a job. Moreover, while departments are occasionally eliminated, eliminated, say, after a major war, the general rule is they get bigger. As such, each head of department or minister or whatever leaves behind an expanded department or ministry, meaning more control and more money for some people, but certainly not taxpayers. So that's the DEA. Now take the bloating of the DEA over decades through federal drug war funding and apply it to police stations all around the U.S. Plus drug war operations in places like Afghanistan, plus aid to foreign militaries and police to help punish poor brown people abroad as well as domestically. The war on drugs has cost over one trillion dollars since 1971. What happened in 1971, by the way? Shout out if you know this one. Richard Nixon wanted to arrest black people, hippies, and whatever other protest movements that emerged from the civil rights era, especially those opposed to his war on Southeast Asia. He knew you couldn't criminalize being black or being against the war, or at least not in those words. So he ramped up prohibitionist rhetoric and formally declared the war on drugs. He now had more options for violence, more power for the law enforcement agencies under him, and the legitimacy that comes from being able to hoodwink the public. People who had an interest in the war on drugs, including politicians with conservative voting bases, attacked Jimmy Carter for softening on drugs. And then when they got their chance, they put all their money behind Ronald Reagan. Reagan expanded the war on drugs on every front, including sending thousands of troops to occupy and prop up dictatorships in Latin America. Under his watch, possibly with his approval, the CIA flooded the poorest parts of the U.S. with crack cocaine. They got a bunch of black people hooked on crack, called it a scourge that needed to be solved with prisons, and sent in the police with new mandates for violence. Drug laws got harsher. Asset forfeiture laws were used more and more to seize property and sell it off to provide more money to police. Between 1980 and 1987, U.S. Spender, spending on countering the international narcotics trade tripled. But by 1989, the DEA earned more revenue from seizures than the budget that Congress allotted it. That's how much it was stealing. And Ronald Reagan was, and still is for some reason, hailed as a small government conservative. Billions of dollars to destroy freedom is not small government. 
A better term would be law and order, which itself is of course a propaganda term, but it means using a lot of violence to establish or re-establish the supremacy of the state. So it's appropriate. Another thing we can learn about the state from all this is how policy has nothing to do with truth. The basis of all the arguments for prohibition were lies. And whenever they were exposed as lies, the state simply doubled down and prosecuted its war harder. They never wanted to help people. If they had, they might have focused on the demand side. Helping drug users get off drugs, treating it like a medical problem, or <laughs> just accepting that people want to get high. You know, freedom. Instead, they focused on the supply side. That had a bunch of advantages for the state, of course. For example, they could target entire countries like Mexico, Peru, Colombia, and Bolivia and increase their influence and their military presence there. Oh, and Panama, let's not forget, where they killed thousands of people to arrest one guy. Also, cops are given credit regularly for, for reaching their quotas, um with drug-related arrests, so they'll go after small fry dealers and users, rather than risk their lives, you know, going after the kingpins. The propaganda demonized drug dealers and users alike and elevated cops to heroes, while only radicals were talking about getting to the root of the problem. It's confusing at first to think of how many people how many people who believe, who say they believe in a free market, say nothing about how every threat to the profit of large corporations is targeted by the law and law enforcement? But, of course, it's less confusing when you remember how indoctrinated they are. They've come to believe in the law without question. The supremacy of the state's laws and its agents. Cannabis is fun. It alleviates pain, relaxes people, and solves a number of medical problems. So it's competition for the pharmaceutical industry. CBD, the harmless but miraculous medicine derived from cannabis, is either illegal or in a legal gray zone. And hemp, also harmless and incredibly useful, is also competition for a whole bunch of industries. So it's pretty illegal in most of the U.S. too. If people saw laws for what they were, just a way of concentrating wealth and power, they would oppose criminalization. But laws always come with justifications like for the children. So people who don't question the law and the propaganda soon come to parrot the rhetoric. Do you want your children to be exposed to drugs? You think they aren't already? You think we should lie to them as if there are no consequences to lying to your children? You think we should throw them in jail to save them? In fact, the propaganda makes us focus on dealers so we don't have to think about the policies that created them. You want violent drug gangs out of your com community? Make drugs legal. They'll become businesses or even better clinics. Learn from alcohol prohibition. Organized crime was decimated by repealing it. Another thing about laws is, while police and courts will usually look the other way if someone rich or influential buys or sells drugs or launders drug money, they won't make exceptions for you out of mercy. People who don't really know how the state works think, well, surely... They're nice people, and they, they'd make an exception for Grandma, right? Who just needs some CBD to relax and feel better. No, they won't. She might have to get it from a dealer. She might go bankrupt trying to buy alternatives. Or she might just suffer and die while her relatives watch. But hey, pharmaceutical companies might not make their fourth quarter expectations if she gets her meds for free. So we better not change anything. Some of the same people, of course, want the state to protect them from organized crime, too. 
They want to attack the surface of the problem by mounting a military campaign against it without changing any of the underlying conditions. They think if you just get rid of the bad people, they'll be safer. But if there's still demand for drugs, there will still be suppliers. And if the drugs are illegal, the suppliers will go underground, arm themselves, form cartels, make huge amounts of money, and increase their influence over the government. An estimated 70% of the global black market comes from drugs, meaning that it's a huge amount of the revenue of organized crime all around the world. Legalize drugs, and you slash their incomes. But then... Drug warriors, the other side of the coin, would lose their jobs too. So they're not interested. The war on drugs was also useful to the state after the end of the Cold War, as drugs could fill the void of who was to be the next enemy after the Soviet Union. Of course, the propaganda had already laid the foundation for drugs to fill that void, so it just slipped in without anyone noticing. The state needs an enemy, at least one. If it has an enemy abroad, it has an excuse to go to war, or at least for its subjects to be afraid and rally around the local devil they know so they don't have to face the scary foreign devil they don't know. If it has an enemy within, the state can attack its enemies, demonize specific groups, in this case black and Hispanic people, as always, and crush civil liberties. The war on drugs is all these things. In that way, it's a pretty typical war, except that it's lasted about a hundred years already. By the way, since 9-11, the enemy was no longer drugs but Muslims. But the war on drugs hasn't slowed down. It's still a great excuse. There are cops in schools now. Dark-skinned people are still the main target. The prisons are still full. And they get enslaved in prison, too. Did you know that? Black people have always been criminalized since the official end of slavery. Vagrancy, loitering, jaywalking, unlawful assembly, voting interracial relationships, being in the wrong part of town, basically being black was illegal. And when they were punished, they were re-enslaved. People think that the 13th Amendment repealed slavery, but if you read it, it says you can legitimately be enslaved for breaking the law. In other words, if you don't do whatever the powerful people who make and enforce the laws tell you to do, you'll become a slave again. That wasn't a loophole or a mistake, by the way. They didn't want to end slavery. Prison corporations today make a killing by farming almost free labor out to big corporations. Walmart buys food grown by enslaved prisoners. McDonald's buys uniforms sewn by enslaved prisoners. Prisoners are even forced to make missile parts. So, so that the same people who are, who are making money off enslaving them can make more money blowing up poor people overseas. So you can see capitalism today relies on slavery. But again, this is normal. Capitalism was built on the backs of enslaved people, mostly Africans. The, the wealth created by slaves enriched uh, a lot of people, though, of course, a small minority in the Americas and in Europe, nearly all of them white, and a lot of wealth is passed down through generations. In these ways, and a million other ways, slavery is still quite relevant to the present. Nowadays, more black people are in prison than were enslaved in 1850. Take as long as you want to think about that. Many of them aren't allowed to refuse slave labor, or they're tortured with solitary confinement. Once you've been to prison, you have a criminal record, which means it's now legal to discriminate against you for jobs, housing, welfare, voting, and so on. 
So which part of all this was an accident that can simply be rectified by education? None of it. It's racism. Racism wrote the Constitution and the laws and 200 years of policy, and it poisoned the culture. Racism built the prisons and manned the police. Racism legitimized locking up black people in droves. Racism makes money for the people who profit off prison labor. Racism keeps black people poor as breadwinners are sent to jail and barred from jobs and keeps the rich rich by profiting off slave labor and the meager wages offered to desperate people. Racism writes off all suffering as black people have the same opportunities as white people. We're all equal under the law and uh, if you don't want to go to jail, don't commit crimes. You can see racism is not just an individual attitude, but a system that's built into the state and capitalist systems. If you try to tackle racism in isolation from these other systems, you will fail. The state needs enemies. The capitalists need profits. Racism provides both. If enemies or profits are running low, the propaganda and laws and wars will go back up. We've seen it. We've seen three strikes laws that send people to prison for life for getting caught a third time. We've seen mandatory minimums serving prison sentences otherwise reserved for serious crimes just for drugs. Crime weights were dropping when Bill Clinton signed ever more draconian crime laws into existence. Joe Biden helped write those laws, and he's running for president now, proving the only criterion voters need to vote for someone is that they seem less bad than the alternative. Lobby groups continue to keep pressure on politicians to retain or even increase the already huge mandate for drug enforcement. Most of them I've mentioned already, pharmaceutical, tobacco, and alcohol producers, police and prison guard unions, uh, prison operators, plus the corporations they outsource to, along with whatever right-wing advocacy groups that are little more than formal fronts for racists. Those groups spend millions on lobbying every year to keep drugs illegal and keep prisons full. This is a typical story of lobbying. Virtually all laws are made by industry insiders who profit from them somehow. The war on drugs is just the most blatant example. P police will do anything to avoid decriminalizing drugs because it's the basis of so much of their power. They use drugs as their excuse to accost and search and arrest and use violence against whomever they want which is inevitably people of color and homeless people more than anyone else. The prison guards know without the huge number of drug-related cases clogging up the system, it would be revealed how little we actually need them. But while people are still getting caged for buying and selling drugs, in other words, crime, prison guards can keep their nice juicy paychecks. It goes to show how cruel a person has to be to be a cop or a prison guard to begin with. They know they're hurting people who haven't done anything wrong, locking them up for years on end, beating them, standing by as they get raped, torturing them in solitary confinement, or enslaving them to some corporation, and having the gall to tell the rest of the world, we need them. Lobbyists themselves could probably be considered an interest group. Most lobbyists who work for the pharmaceutical industry, the tobacco industry, or the big alcohol producers used to work for the state. You can find all this on opensecrets.org. That's a pretty big conflict of interest, don't you think? The people who tell us they're regulating the big corporations are actually richly rewarded by them. But again, this is all normal. It's quite normal to lead to what's called regulatory capture, 
where the state agency in charge of regulating an industry ends up working for the big players in that industry. It happens with every regulatory agency. Banking has dozens of regulatory agencies, yet big banks launder billions of dollars in drug money and they get away with it. And this should tell you everything you need to know about so-called regulation and government oversight. No wonder with so much money going into using violence against sellers and users, the statistics of drug prohibition are so grim. Every 25 seconds, someone is in America is arrested for drug possession. One-fifth of the people in prison is serving time for a drug charge. Incarcerating people has no effect on substance use rates or on public safety. Of course, there are all kinds of racial disparities. Black Americans are four times more likely to be arrested for marijuana charges than their white peers. Black Americans make up nearly 30% of all drug-related arrests, despite accounting for only 12.5% of all substance users. Nearly six times more likely to be incarcerated for drug-related offenses than white counterparts. Almost 80% of people serving time for a federal drug offense are black or Latino. Um, the average black defendant convicted of a drug offense will serve nearly the same amount of time as a white defendant would for a violent crime. People of color account for 70% of all defendants convicted of charges with a mandatory minimum. Prosecutors are twice as likely to pursue a mandatory minimum sentence for a black defendant than a white defendant charged with the same offense. Hmm. I hope you're not shocked and surprised by any of this. At least 40 million people have been arrested on drug offenses since 1971 in the U.S. And hundreds of thousands around the world have died, various causes, but all traceable to the war on drugs. So let's summarize. Victimless pursuits are criminalized, meaning people and freedom are criminalized meaning huge amounts of violence, especially against poor, sick, and racialized and colonized people, which is why these policies and the police get so much support from the right wing. That violence leads to more money for corporate interests, more racist propaganda, higher crime rates, more people in prison, more power for the federal government, including federal police, more money and influence for bureaucrats, Bigger budgets and mandates for police, prisons, military, spies, which in turn lead to more racist policing, more violence, and less freedom for everyone. Let's not make the mistake of calling the war on drugs a failed policy. That would imply the people behind it were acting in good faith. There's no evidence of that. How is using violence to protect your profit margins a failure of policy? It's actually a pretty typical policy. These things aren't failures, they're successes. You're just under the misapprehension the state is supposed to work for you. Same reason we'd be wrong to say the system or the police are corrupted or broken and in need of reform. That implies you could fix the system so it works for everyone. It can't. It works for the ruling class. We shouldn't just change or repeal laws to decriminalize drugs. That's just basic decency. The bare minimum. We should also be letting out everyone who's in prison on drug charges and expunge their records. Someone told me we can't do that because they were violating the law at the time. Who cares? Everyone violates the law. Everyone commits crimes. You are a criminal. Most laws are shitty laws and we should not recognize or respect them. The law is just an excuse to avoid being fair and compassionate. Besides, if we just change the laws, any group of politicians could just change them back. These laws, along with laws regarding sex work, 
regulate the body itself. The state claims ownership of your body. So like a parent watching a child, it tells you what you're not allowed to do with your body. Why would we want anyone to have that kind of power over us? But as long as the state exists, it will claim that power. And it will use that power to make its capitalist friends richer. The war on drugs is a symptom of a disease we call capitalism. It's an excellent example of how capitalism and the state operate, using violence, stirring up racism, using propaganda to gain more money and power at everyone else's expense. The whole system needs to end, so this kind of injustice can end.